we fought. We fought to be out here. Like we, we're not in the center of the city. I mean, 80% of Copenhageners that came to eat here when we first opened had never even been here. The demand from those chefs and budding restaurateurs is enormous. And it frustrates me because there's this big talent pool and I don't know what to do with that. I don't need a swan outside my window and uh, it's something that's unrealistic. I'm quite an easygoing guy, but I, if I could just see the sun, <gasps> I'll get some fresh air sometimes, open a window. Hello and welcome to The Recipe, a podcast about restaurants and the people behind them. I'm your host, James Clasper. In previous episodes of The Recipe, we've explored the new normal for the restaurant industry, met some brave individuals who have opened a restaurant during the pandemic, and discussed how to turn ideas for restaurants into reality. But in this episode, I want to bring things back down to earth, quite literally. You see, the number one reason that almost two thirds of restaurants fail within their first year is their location. Open any textbook on launching restaurants, and I'm assuming there is such a thing, and the standard advice about location scouting is to consider demographic factors, like the median age and income of a particular neighborhood. In this episode, we're not gonna talk about any of that, at least not directly. Instead, we're gonna hear from an American chef who took a big risk with his restaurant's location in Copenhagen, as well as from the co-founder of an English restaurant whose rural location is critical to its goal of being as seasonal, ethical, and local as possible. We'll also talk to a London property consultant to find out why some restaurant operators succeed in finding a prime location, while others struggle. For now though, we're gonna stay put in Copenhagen and try to understand why one of Denmark's most successful chefs has spent more than two years searching for the right location for his new restaurant. Thorsten Vilgol was just 26 when he was named Chef of the Year in Denmark in 2005. He then spent seven years at Noma, holding a number of roles, including in the fabled Test Kitchen, until Klaus Meyer lured him to the other side of the harbour in 2013 to head up Studio, which won a Michelin star just four months later. In 2017, René Redzepi invited Torsten back to Noma to be his right-hand man, a position he held until spring 2019, when he decided it was time to launch his own restaurant again. Given all the awards and accolades, you might think that that would be easy. Think again. Late last year, I met up with Torsten at his house in southern Copenhagen, and once he had made us both coffee, I asked him to tell me what kind of space he had been looking for, and why it had been so difficult. I'm looking for a space where I can grow, but I'm also very realistic about it. I'm not looking for a thousand square meters uh, located at the best spot in Copenhagen. I'm much more of a humble guy, but I, and I'm looking for a space and enough square meters where we can do things correct. So I would like not to go down the stairs and hit my head. It should be easy for the waiters to clear the table, go out and put it in a dish where there's enough space as such. And I'm not asking for something that's not reasonable, but I also believe that for, to cook for 30 people, you need around 300 to 400 square meters. Many of you guys have probably seen this picture where you see an iceberg, just the tip of the iceberg. And then you see it's like one fifth of it. And then you have like the rest hidden under the water, right? That's kind of how I see a restaurant. You see the dining room? Where is where you make the money and maybe you have a lounge or you have the toilet and stuff. But you know, the space where you have the, the guest is kind of small compared to what you need. Because you need storage, you need wine cellar, you need changing rooms, you need a prep kitchen. And if you want to do things correct and you want to do things right, then you need space to do that. So of course, there's not a lot of these spaces. And I have been very close five times now uh, within the two years sitting with the pen, ready to sign. And then the day before, the salesman or, you know, the government puts a fucking stick in the wheel and it doesn't work out. But I was also hoping some opportunities would have been popped up during that period. Not that I wanted any of my colleagues to close, but you know, maybe some of the landlords have been 
looking at you know, a lot of office space has been been minimized because people now work from home and so they don't need that much office space i've been flirting with ideas of trying to be a little creative because there's no real restaurants as such maybe i could build a restaurant in a location that's not a restaurant i have also been looking at warehouses because here the square meters are fairly cheap and we have like a a, a big frame where we can just set up our own walls and we can create you know our own infrastructure you know and then i also been looking at uh, some beautiful locations up north but when you move up there then you know the last bus goes at 11 30. so how do how do the staff go home afterwards staff is maybe mo one of the most difficult things nowadays to put into a restaurant to be honest i want to make it difficult for myself but I don't need to make it stupidly difficult for myself to, to put myself in too far away where it's too difficult, first of all, for the guests. But they can always take a taxi, right? A chef cannot always take a taxi. And then you finish up like one o'clock in the morning and you have to be there again, maybe eight or nine in the morning. And I also have two kids. Uh, and since I'm going to be in the restaurant most of my life and uh, weekdays, I also would like a spot where they can just come and visit. Or at least my wife can take the car and come and they could join us for staff meal. Or like this big dream that I have that my daughters can just take the metro and uh, and come by themselves and sit and do some homeworks and, you know, I can be chopping some stuff. I don't want to move away from my kids. I want this restaurant to be something else brings us together even though i'm going to invest a lot of time and effort in this uh, because i'm going to be a, a chef that's going to be there every day when we are open you can see there's a few things to take into consider but it doesn't mean that i have said no to to these things only on these terms because it sounds when i say it i, I don't know if it sounds a little too spoiled like oh if my you know it has to be like 500 meters from my house and you know it's not what I'm saying. I love, I love to bike, but to bike 20 kilometers one way and 20 kilometers the other way, whew, that's uh, maybe fun the first week. And then my your legs are tired. Also, be standing up for 12 hours or more. No, uh, no, that's that was not what I was looking for. So uh, yeah, as you can hear, I've been searching all sorts of opportunities. And I would say that I probably have been looking at 60 locations. And like I said, five of them has been narrowed down to almost signing a contract and never happened. From a logistical point of view, I mean, do you have a, a broker that's kind of scouting the market for you? I have activated every single broker in Copenhagen. I used family members and their network. And do you know someone? I've been so frustrated that I found myself, you know, asking people, like, oh, do you, you know, I'm also on a journey looking for a restaurant. Do you know anybody? You know, there's like rings in the water. Maybe I have everybody out looking for it uh, for me. Already this morning before you came, I been on the phone activating the network again, telling them, yes, please go out and scout again. Uh, and please do not show me the same fucking stuff that I've been looking at three times. <laughs> there has been times where I've been looking at a location. One time where I like said, this, this doesn't work. First of all, it's, the rent is maybe like ridiculously high. And like, I'm going to have 30 covers. You know that. Who the fuck is going to pay for this rent? And then next time you talk to him, you know, he puts the same spot out as, as a suggestion. And you're like... Did I miss something out? And then you're like, okay, let's go out. Maybe the landlord is willing to reduce the price a bit. And yeah, and then you look at the space again and it's like, there was a reason why we sifted it away. And the third time over half a year and the guy kind of mentioned the same. It's like, come on, dude, find something else, please. <laughs> You mentioned that, uh, you know, you wouldn't want to be kind of running up and down stairs, banging heads and so forth. And, um, and that's a reflection of how you've changed. But is it also a reflection, do you think, of how the industry is thinking about 
the health and safety of people in the industry and, and the environment in which, in which they wish to work. Definitely. In the old days, many restaurants were in a basement, you know, and they were never saw the sun. You were just working in this basement environment, a little bit difficult to breathe, and maybe the extraction were not the best, and so on and so on. And as a guest or as a as a, a worker, you never knew if it was raining or if the sun was shining and stuff like that. It used to be like that for a lot of restaurants. But now we work so many hours, we put so much effort into this. So why not? having a window where you can have some light and you're not necessarily wants to look at a dumpster you know or a container or something like that and it's not to say that you want to you know you know a lake with a swan uh, moving around but working on this high level that i also represent you know to also be creative and get inspired and stuff like that it doesn't come necessarily just by itself all the time you also need to be in a in a healthy work environment that can kind of let your mind go because you get pressure from you know, the daily routines of being ready for service and all this. So there's so much things going on. If you want people to work for you on, you know, on tough terms, because as a chef, you work on tough terms, but you can might as well do your best to make them good as long as you're there and make it uh, as healthy and good for them to go to work. And I also want to put my, my foot down and also want to, you know, if I need to tell my family that they're only going to see me one or two times during a week for the next many, many years to come. It has to be done correct. But yet again, I don't need a swan outside my window and uh, it's something that's unrealistic. I'm quite an easygoing guy, but I, if I could just see the sun, <laughs> I'll get some fresh air, sometimes open a window. Many restaurants actually cannot even open the windows because you know they're located in a building where people are living above or something like that. And it's like, it's suffocating. It kind of drains you. And that's not what I want to achieve as a chef. You've had two years to, to, to think about finding the right location. Has anything else evolved in your thinking about restaurants in that time? Definitely. In the beginning of these two years that I started to look, I almost had a team ready to sign off for me, where now I have zero. And that is, is also something that a few months back, I was biting my nails off, uh, being like, oh, fuck. You know, one thing is we can sign a deal. What about a team now? Because I cannot do this project by myself. I'm going to have chefs. I'm going to have a restaurant manager. I need that. But with, th throughout these two years, I have also just came to, came to this conclusion that I want to have, of course, professional people around me. This is an ambition project. But I also want people around me that I like that uh, not necessarily are the best of the best in our trade. And hopefully it doesn't sound wrong, but actually people that I like and that I, I have respect for me so we can agree on the terms that we are doing. But I'd rather go to work being surrounded by people that I feel like a family thing with that I would like to see on my days off as well. I haven't asked you about the cooking that you, that you hope to do in this, this new restaurant. Tell me about it. It's going to be rooted in the Nordic. Uh, it's such a big part of me and I love the Nordic ingredients and what the forest and the fields has to offer in terms of herbs and flowers and nuts and berries and game meat and all this. But it's not going to be only Nordic ingredients because I have a, a big love for the French kitchen as well. So like being able to use truffles. So it's going to be a merge between the French and the Nordic. If you have these parents going to bed and the baby comes out of that, it's going, hopefully going to be my restaurant. I know I have the ability to grow. That's also why I need the space too, because it would be such a shame that I put myself in a, in a spot where I cannot grow. And then I would need to move after two or three years again. My ambition is to go for two Michelin stars. I had one. I haven't been out away from the trade that long, so I will get back into it. But that is one of my goals for, for this project. How do you stay kind of match fit, so to speak? I haven't been on the field playing the big league. I've been sitting a little bit on the bench, looking at all the other guys playing and progressing. So I felt at times that it's been like super unfair. And I've also been doubting myself occasionally. Is it because 
no, those people doesn't like me. You know, you know, you 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 become at one one point uh, I've 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 became so paranoid or not paranoid but so sad that I was like, wow, you know, maybe it's not meant to be. Maybe I don't have. I mean, I'm doubting that people think that I have something to contribute with or do they don't like my flavors. You know, when you have it with yourself and you only have also because it's difficult to talk about these things. And I, I don't know if I'm doing something wrong or, you know, but hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, you could, if you could see my face, it would be like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> uh, but it's about being patient. That was Torsten Vilgo, who, per his Instagram page, is currently looking for a restaurant. And, well, I'm pretty sure he would appreciate any leads listeners may have. Coming up, we're heading to London to find out more about the restaurant scene there. But first, a little interlude, as we hear from two chefs who describe where their restaurants are located. In a minute or two, we'll hear from Darren Brown, the chef director at Restaurant Hen, a 14-cover eatery in the historic English market town of Morton in Marsh. But first, here's Matt Orlando talking about the pros and cons of launching his restaurant, Amass, in one of Copenhagen's least accessible locations back in 2013. We had a good kind of burst of energy right off the bat, uh, which was great. You know, we came out here eight years ago and we were the only ones out here. Taxis wouldn't come out here. There's be dudes smoking weed right in front of the front window and not really caring that there was... 60 people inside having dinner. Back then, Ref Saloon was like so far away. There was nothing out here. And it was so cool to come around here. I mean, the amount of exploratory walks I've had out here by myself and like finding open doors and getting to the tops of buildings and having this crazy view that obviously those doors are all locked now. It's, um, and all the warehouses are filled with businesses. It was really cool. And that's what really drew me out here. And it was this kind of, we were in the country, but it was just post-industrial and it was really, I loved it, you know, it, it, but we fought, we fought to be out here. Like we, we're not in the center of the city. I mean, 80% of Copenhageners that came to eat here when we first opened had never even been here. Even Renee told me, he's like, you're crazy. And uh, fast forward three years ago, you know, Renee moved Noma out here. I say, I remember having the conversation with him. He's like, oh, we're gonna come out and be by you. And I was like, you're crazy, Renee. <laughs> Renee has also supported us a lot and sent a lot of people out here to see us and, and stuff like that. And so it's, it was cool to see them move out here. And it did open this whole area up even more. Up until like two years ago, we, just, we were just out here alone almost. And then they opened the street food market, which, yeah, great for the area. It brings a lot of people out here. But it's, I mean, for us, it's not a amazing <laughs> You know, all the traffic for that goes directly between us and our garden, and it kind of creates that separation now, which is not ideal. And it's great for the wine bar and when we were doing fried chicken and stuff, it, because a lot of food traffic comes out here. But for a mass, it really it compromises the pass. I, I find ourselves boxing, we're boxing ourselves in a little bit, and it's 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 frustrating on a lot of levels. And you know, I kind of wish the area itself was managed a bit better. There's a lot of bathrooms out here and there's 5,000 people coming out here. And it's just, uh, you're just managing a group, like a herd of people coming out here. You're just managing them and trying to keep them from destroying all your stuff that you have outside. And they come, they, there's like a wave of them that come this way. They do some damage, but when they come back, when they're drunk, that's when the real uh, excitement, if you will, starts for us. Our, our greenhouse has been slashed three times this summer. It's only been slashed once in eight years before that. We can't build fires in the garden anymore because it just attracts all these people that just start burning shit. Some guy was like breaking down a wooden, like just ripping apart one of our wooden planter boxes to burn it one night. I'm like, what are you doing, bro? Get out of here. I guess I was hoping the area to develop in a, in a different way. And you, know, you can see that, you know, this area is, is slated to be like developed, like apartments and stuff like that. And, it, and it's a shame because there's such a cool ecosystem out here. Like between us and Empirical and Bakina and Lille, it, it, it's the reason people come out here. And so to kind of like give it to the animals is, is frustrating sometimes. But one thing I learned from Renee working at Noma is like, stay the course. Do not waver from what you believe in. Because eventually it will 
pay off. It'll be a fight to get there. And that was one thing that I really took from working at Noma in the early days, because I was there a year after they opened and just fighting lunches with two people in the dining room and 17 for dinner. But he never strayed the course and he just kept going. And that I just always remember that experience in my head. I'm the chef director at Restaurant Hen in Morton in Marsh. We try to be as local as we can, ethical as we can, and sustainable as we can. We buy all our produce within sort of 15, 20 miles of the restaurant, and we aim to give a, uh, a really personable, uh, enjoyable evening to our to our guests. Uh, you know, Morton itself as well is a. Uh, it's not really renowned for its food scene, but over the last year or two years, you know, there's a few more businesses starting to open up that are, you know, very food led orientated. And, you know, we've got a new wine um, shop. There's a, a brand new bakery, Otis and Bell, which is fantastic. And there's another local business coming in, uh, which is more of a farm shop cafe type thing. It's a market square town. It's right in the center of the country, really in the Gloucestershire countryside, very small, close knit community. So, um, yeah, we just felt it was either going to uh, be a, a fantastic addition and work, or it would be an eyesore and not work. And, and luckily it's, it's, uh, gone the first way. The ultimate goal would be to have our own kitchen garden, but obviously being in a, a, a small town like Morton land is at a premium and, and we don't have that site yet, but we are actively looking for it and we've got a couple of leads, but hopefully within, within the year we'll have somewhere and start growing our own and then be as, you know, truly local as we can. Yeah. We want to be as sustainable and and local as we can and, and use as much produce from around the area. The big picture of everything is it's, it's the right thing to do. I mean, that's what you sh everybody should be doing. You know, the, the mass produced and mass farmed, uh, produce is, you know, that's, that's hurting the planet and, and, you know, the, with the global situation with it is at the moment, especially with Brexit and uh, the pandemic, you know, why are we buying stuff from France, no matter how good it is, you know, we have fantastic local producers, uh, local butcher is Paddock Farm. They produce some of the best pork there. They have Tamworth rare breed and, and that pork is incredible. So why buy, you know, mass produced sort of supermarket quality, if you like, for, for next to nothing, but you can, when you can have a, a supremely excellent product like theirs and, and use that. Like I say, it's the right thing to do. We, yeah, with regards to our produce and, and things, we are buying so local that, you know, the, the, we can go and pick stuff up. You know, I often go around in the car and I go to the Cornbury Park where we get our venison from and I just drive down there, have a chat and a coffee with Tom, the gamekeeper and, and, you know, pick up a venison and drive back. So it's a very relaxed kind of way of doing things. We are pretty much full every week, which makes ordering and planning very easy. So I know exactly really what I need to buy. And, you know, because our suppliers are so local, if I do mess up or we do get busy, I can just nip out and go and grab it. You know, that's the other advantage of not using a national veg company that's 80 miles away, you know, the whatever this, you know, everything is so local. If I do need something, I can run out and get it. The biggest compliment and the biggest success that our business will will be judged on is is if we're full and if we're still there in a few years. We want to do this as a long-term project and, uh, you know, we're not in to do it for a couple of years and then sell it on or, you know, you know make a fortune out of it. You know, we, we really want to do it because we're passionate and we believe that, you know, we can give people an entertaining evening and do it, you know, with, with nice food and our ultimate judgment is that whether we're still here in a few years still successfully you know filling the place and and that's that's it that was darren brown of restaurant hen in morton and marsh and we're going to stay in england for the final part of the episode you see torsten vogor's difficulty finding the right spot for his restaurant got me thinking what do landlords look for in restaurant operators and why do they care only about the financial viability of a new restaurant or are other factors on the table too? And how might landlords be more creative about helping would-be restaurateurs like Torsten? To get some answers, I turned to Camilla Topham. She's the co-founder of District, a London-based consultancy that works on behalf of major property owners and landlords, like the Crown Estate, Borough Market, and the Shaftesbury Estate, which owns much of the West End. So if anyone knows what an address for success might be, it would likely be Camilla. I called her recently and began by asking her 
to tell me more about District. District is a hospitality property consultancy and we essentially work on behalf of landlords to find amazing restaurants and chefs and food and leisure operators in in their estates. So we're essentially an agent who acts on behalf of landlords to broker the lease, but we undertake a lot of strategic work really. And, And our clients are really the landlords who care about their restaurants and food and beverage offer within their developments and estates. And whilst we act for the landlords, We've got really close relationships with all the operators. Okay, so let's go back to basics. Why is a restaurant's location so important, do you think? Location ultimately impacts on the type of restaurant business that it can be. And, you know, I think any operator who's looking for a space has to look closely at at those dynamics of the area and really understand like how they're offering and what they want to do fits in with those dynamics. I mean, there is, of course, some operators who can literally locate in the middle of nowhere and the, and the people will come like the nomas of the world but mostly you know o- operators would would want to really sort of pair their offering with an area that has compatible dynamics really whether that's a strong lunch trade you know for example if you go out to east london or more neighborhood areas you it might just be an evening trade you know and all of this impacts on budget and the overall model and what can afford to be paid and and rent essentially okay so tell me what are the sort of questions that restaurateurs should really be asking as they look for a suitable location for their next restaurant we have lots of meetings with operators where they come into our office and they've got a new concept and we sit down and talk about where it would fit and i think the first question that we always sort of ask really is you know what is the offering like who is who is your customer and secondly it's really important to just know what their budget is because if you've got a really low budget and you're just not going to be able to afford soho rents then you will have to look at more neighborhood locations perhaps look a bit further east if it's quite an edgy food concept and so that it's really critical budget is is everything okay now let's flip that question round um when landlords are looking for the right restaurant to fill a vacant property, what kind of questions do they typically have for uh, for restaurant operators? Our clients are always looking for the best, you know, the best in class. It doesn't always have to be something new, but just something really, really good, like really good quality. Our role really is to pair landlords with operators that are complementary to their objectives at the end of the day and it's it's different for different types of landlords you know we have to get under the skin of that in order to you know do the right deals for them and introduce them to the right operators you know for some landlords it's really just about rent and security of income we have a thing called covenant which is something which is a little bit historic now but where a landlord would literally look at accounts and financial standing and, and make a decision on that basis but We don't see landlords making decisions like that now and certainly not the landlords that we work with. For someone like Shaftesbury, they want the most relevant new restaurant brands going into their estate. You know, this is a really strong central London destination and they're a best in class landlord. So they want to know who are those people, who is the next big thing. But whilst every landlord has different criteria, the one sort of thread really is Backing is important. We see lots of new concepts come through um, for more independent operators, but landlords are also looking for comfort that it's the right team in place and that the team is experienced and that they're able to run a restaurant and that it, this restaurant is likely to be successful and that they can afford to fit it out and that they can afford to pay the rent. So we do look closely at backing and, and who the team of that restaurant is. For a landlord like Borough Market, Their criteria is very much sustainability based. Borough Market is a charity, so they cannot make a profit. And they have a board of trustees who are in place to protect the market and, you know, just protect the heritage of it and make sure that the right operators go in. And they score every single restaurant proposal we get. And whoever gets the highest score is is the operator that they choose. And the scoring is very much sustainability initiatives, provenance, sourcing, company ethics. And I think we kind of hope to see more of that with other landlords. And, you know, sustainability is a key driver for landlords now as well as restaurant operators. And we we definitely think that landlords will show more interest in tenant sustainability initiatives going forward. So if I've understood you correctly, while landlords want to see who's backing a project and whether it's financially viable, other factors are in the mix, right? 
is it fair to say that landlords will consider whether restaurants are able to attract other tenants in their commercial spaces and that that's one of their key considerations? Yeah, so we worked with Derwent London who own the T building, which is obviously a really iconic building and they've got really amazing office space in there. They've got Soho House in there and, you know, their restaurants that we've done there have had to complement that offering and you know, fit into that overall destination. And you're absolutely right. For someone like Derwent, who are, you know, most of the space in all of their buildings is office space. It's absolutely critical that that restaurant operator would complement that and be somewhere that those office users will go. And in the tea building we put in, Lyles was the first restaurant space that we had, which they created, which is incredible. And it's a destination as well. You know, people travel from all over the world to go to Lyles. And more recently, even though it's a few years back now, they had a strip club <laughs> on the corner, which is now Smoking Goat and Brat. Again, like two incredible restaurants. And, you know, Derwent London are really, they really care about having great relationships with their restaurant operators as well. So we always make sure we're introducing Derwent to a restaurant that we feel like they're going to gel on a personal level as well, because they their relationships are, are absolutely critical. So does that mean then that it can be much, much harder for an independent or first time restaurateur to get their foot on the ladder to find the right location? I think that is fair. It can be really difficult for people striking out on their own to get a good site. I was actually working with an amazing chef recently and she's got a brand new concept, which hopefully is going to open this year. And she's been looking for a site for over six years and um, this year she will finally open her restaurant and it's been a really long journey for her because you know she had this amazing concept and the landlords all liked it and now she's got this team in place around her she's really well backed by a guy who's got a really successful restaurant group and I think that's really it's all those pieces that come together that really sort of help with that but I think if you've got a new concept, it, it can be really worthwhile for those independents to do a pop-up or a supper club first so the landlords can actually see it because it can be really hard just having a presentation deck and, you know, really understanding how the restaurant's going to be and how it's going to trade. I mean, we see a lot of things on paper that look great, but actually turning that into a fully functioning restaurant, it, it, it takes so much more than just an idea. We often see a lot of brand new concepts coming out of things like Box Park and Pop Brixton and containers and also pop-ups in pubs and I think it is those stepping stones that need to be in place first for those operators and and often when they have the supper clubs or the pop-up they then attract a team they attract a funder or an investor who's got hands-on experience and that really is what unlocks the sites with the with the very best landlords. Now I'd like to uh, I'd like to shift gears a little here and and talk about residency. Residency was a was a concept you launched a few years ago, right? To support startup restaurateurs and independent operators. Can you tell me a bit more about it? We worked with the Crown Estate. There's a street called Hedden Street, which is a restaurant street in London. And they got a fully fitted restaurant back. And they thought about having a bit of fun with the site and doing some pop-ups in there and essentially turning it into a, an incubator. It was a fully fitted restaurant site, had everything in it, even crockery and glasses. So we launched a incubator with them and put in the first tenant, which was actually called Ten Hedden Street, which is, and they've now gone on to open a restaurant called Manteco in Shoreditch. And it was really, really successful. And it rotates every six months or so. And we worked with a restaurant consultancy in terms of them actually helping the operator. And at that time we thought, well, this is great. Like, surely, you know, we can do this in any site. And just seeing how it really regenerated the street as well and attracted footfall and kind of changed the area. So we launched Residency, which essentially was a project to sort of populate vacant restaurant sites with independent operators and help them by actually helping them to trade like the chef that you just talked about who's got a great new concept but doesn't have a front of house team we could do the whole thing we could put them into a property and also teach them and help them how to run a restaurant so we just thought it was an absolute no-brainer there's just so many people that have got new concepts and so many chefs that want to open things and there's such big barriers in the way to that in terms of everything we've just talked about having rent having a budget having a full team but we definitely have experienced limited demand from landlords. And T- Ten Hedden Street's been hugely successful. And The Crown, you know, all credit to them. It's been their initiative and they've invested in it. And I think that's, 
that's the barrier that residency faces is that it needs some investment from the landlord and there has been limited demand, not because they don't love the idea and that they don't want to do pop-ups, but sites in central London come at a premium and actually we haven't seen that big influx of vacant property come to the market. And when we have seen vacant properties, there's been demand from operators to take them on a lease and really the appetite for landlords to invest in it has been really limited. What what do you want to see landlords doing to be more creative and to make life easier for first time rest returns for for those independent operators? What 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 can they do? What do you want to see them doing? Property valuation needs to change really, which would then help landlords be a little bit more creative. But we have seen a lot of creativity in the past year. I mean, we've seen things like landlords giving independence loans to fit out space, which is something that we hadn't really seen at all you know, before the pandemic. We're seeing landlords like committed to getting independence into their estates and loaning them the money to fit out. And that's hugely creative. And but I think, you know, I think we really like, we still love the idea of residency and we get follows every day on residency from another new concept, another new supper club, another new chef, a pastry chef who's got an idea. The demand from those chefs and budding restaurateurs is enormous. And it frustrates me because there's this big talent pool and I don't know what to do with that. And it's, there's got to be a home for it. There's got to be a way of being able to break down barriers somewhere. I don't know what the answer is yet, but that mindset has to change. That was Camilla Topham of the London Property Consultancy District. And I hope that she and others like her find a way to make it easier for independent restaurateurs to get their foot on the ladder. Because it doesn't feel right that experienced chefs like Torsten Vilgel can't find the right location for the kind of restaurant they want to open. To carry on the football metaphor, talents like his shouldn't be left on the bench. And it's especially galling when you stop to consider quite how much the hospitality industry does for cities like London and Copenhagen, how much tourism the restaurant sector brings in, how much cultural capital chefs and restaurants generate. In that light, it's curious that so little appears to be done at the municipal level to help restaurateurs get their foot in the door. I mean, it's all very well saying that the wrong location is the number one reason why so many restaurants fail within the first year. But if would-be restaurateurs can't find the right location in the first place, is it really any wonder that many make fateful compromises or just give up on their dreams entirely? Then again, in the absence of any kind of market correction, one long-term consequence of all this may be the rise of the destination restaurant in the suburbs. A recent New York Times story noted that while the American suburbs are most often associated with restaurant chains, an increasing number of independent restaurants are, quote, raising the collective aspirations of the local culinary culture and turning suburbs into dining destinations. And that makes sense, right? With more people likely to work from home now, destination dining in the city center is less attractive, or at the very least, less convenient. And as the Times put it, as people move to the suburbs from the cities, they bring with them their appetite for more sophisticated, varied menus. So who knows, the apparent increase in independent restaurants setting up shop in the burbs could well signify a sea change in how we dine out. Or, like so many other trends before it, it could just be another flash in the pan. Excuse the pun then, but watch this space. Now, if you're a fan of British accents, I've got good news. And if not, well, it's a wonder you're still listening, quite frankly. You see, Superb has just launched in the UK, and so I can't wait to start featuring more British restaurants on the recipe. Right now, we're planning episodes on restaurant design, the role of technology in restaurants, and improving working conditions and mental health in the industry. So if you've got a story to tell or a point of view you want to share, we'd love to hear from you. Just drop me a line at james.clasper at superbexperience.com or DM us on Instagram and we'll take it from there. This episode of The Recipe was written, produced, and hosted by me, James Clasper, for Superb. Many thanks for listening. See you next time.